to our latest episode of the Lebanese Physicians Podcast. And today our guest is Manuel Mano Shakian. He's currently a second year medical student at the University of uh, Belamend in, uh, in Lebanon. And actually the way I got contacted by Manuel is uh, through LinkedIn. He was listening to our podcast with uh, Dr. Mariana Helwa and then discovered it and was very excited to, uh, to help us out with it. Today, we will be discussing multiple fads in medicine that are being circulated on social media, and uh, we will analyze whether they're true or false. Uh, Manuel, welcome to the podcast. Hi, uh, Dr. Diab. Glad to be on the podcast. It's an honor for me, and uh, I'm looking forward to having a fruitful talk. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's like these days you you go on uh, social media, you go on Instagram, you go on uh, uh, on Google and people like start Googling things or looking at things on TikTok or Instagram, discussing treatment of various diseases. And uh, a lot of this, I mean, it's very hard these days to like know if this evidence-based or not evidence-based and uh, it's very hard to delineate this. And I think you are much younger than us. So you're into this uh, TikTok and Instagram trend uh, much more than us. Can you tell us a bit about this trend and how it's circulating in Lebanon? Yes. Definitely. Uh, this phenomenon that we're talking about is not only happening in Lebanon, it's happening worldwide. Basically, everyone on TikTok or on Instagram has become a doctor, between quotation marks. Everyone is giving medical advice, sometimes, maybe most of the time. Such advice does not have any medical basis. And it, I think, quite frankly, any advice that is given without any scientific basis or without being accredited in what you're talking about could be uh, dangerous to public health. Uh, such destructive trends could be a problem. So uh, I think we need to talk about them. We're going to name a few now and we are going to observe how absurd things are getting and uh, what absurd ideas are out there on the internet, especially on TikTok. It's, it's getting crazy and, uh, and out of, the, out of uh, this world. Right, exactly. And the scary part is people following it without looking uh, more into it. So one of, one of them is, I think, is, uh, is uh, people who have uh, a lot of earwax. Uh, like there's one that was circulating, uh, which said uh, putting a uh, uh, lit candle in your ear uh, to remove the earwax. Does that help? And how did yes. this start circulating in the first place? Yes, that that is an idea. And uh, I'm, I might link the video for this. I could put it. Uh, apparently, this method is called the uh, coning or uh, just ear candling. The idea behind it says you light up a candle and you put the other side in your ear, definitely, or you would burn yourself. And supposedly, it creates a, a type of vacuum in your ear and sucks the earwax out. Uh, that might just be one of the craziest ideas I've heard because it's definitely not, it's definitely not true. Can, we are talking about the risks of burn and injury because of that. We are talking about uh, earwax compaction because of this. When you put the candle in your ear, you are pushing the earwax even further, which is going to cause damage to the ear. And uh, putting aside everything related to infection because of inserting a foreign body right into the ear. It's funny. I, I'm going to put in the link. I'm going to put in the video so people can actually watch and, uh, and assess for themselves. Anyway... To be the devil's advocate, such a practice has no scientific basis. Au contraire, like they say, no, it's actually very dangerous to do. And I do not recommend anyone to do it or even listen to anyone on TikTok giving this advice. Yeah, because I think, I guess, I guess I, I, I can't. I'm trying to figure out like how if you put a burning, like a lit candle into your ear, how that would create a vacuum. I don't see yeah. that happening. It doesn't. It, I don't know who came up with the idea, and yeah. I this end of uh, uh, coming up with conspiracy theories and sensationalism. Uh, it's. Uh, I don't even know how people could give such fake doctors even a chance on a platform to be able to give such information. It's gonna get crazier. I swear. I'm gonna. Uh, th this is just getting started. If we're talking about this, if we're mentioning yeah, I mean, this. I can, I can see it, for example, if you've got hair in your ear, you can potentially <laughs> burn the hair out, get the wax out from the... 
from the ear. Exactly. But, yeah, but I think exactly. I mean, they, they, yeah, the, the other way is I mean, to, I mean, these days even they say don't use cotton balls to to take the earwax out of your ear. But you can if you can't hear very well if it affects your hearing, then you can potentially go to an ENT specialist, and uh, they can clean out your ear that way. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because I think earwax, I mean, that's its effect mostly on you is on your hearing. I think just can decrease like your hearing in the ear that's affected by the earwax, and that's how you would want to clean it in that case. Exactly, but uh, the, without talking about all the benefits benefits of earwax, it's there for a reason. It's there to protect our uh, ear canal, and there are methods to clean out earwax in a certain way if it's obstructing anything. So uh, there are specialists for that. <laughs> not TikTok doctors. And the other one I think that came out crazy is ingesting borax, uh, which is laundry powder containing sodium borate uh, for joint pain relief. I mean, we know uh, there's a lot of people, uh, especially older people who have uh, wear and tear arthritis or osteoarthritis and have a lot of pains in their joints. Uh, uh, but also there's younger people who do sports and have like sports injuries. Uh, so where did that come from? Ingesting borax and uh, where was that video uh, posted? Okay, that video was also posted on TikTok. We'll also link, uh, we'll, we also link that. I don't know who came up with it. I don't know how it started. I don't even know how they are professing the scientific basis behind it. It's crazy. Basically, borax is a type of detergent in the US. It's sodium borate its chemical name is sodium borate and someone on the internet i don't know who that guru is came out with the idea the idea started with that guy that ingesting sodium borate will cause joint pain relief we're talking about ingesting laundry detergent imagine that laundry detergent it it causes uh, joint pain relief okay so uh, again to state no, that has no scientific basis. It is unsafe. It is toxic. It will cause many symptoms, such as poisoning, and it could even cause death. It will accumulate in the body, which will also be uh, chronically toxic to the body. And it's not the mainstay for uh, joint pain treatment. You have joint pain, you go to the doctor, you are given uh, medication. If you have arthritis, if you have knee pain, Ankle pain, shoulder pain? No, no, no. That's that's definitely not uh, not recommended at all. So what's by the way? What's sodium borate? Like what? What is it made of? Like is it an, is it an? I mean, laundry detergent is al alkali, right? It's like a base, I think. Yes, yes. It's basically uh, a base. It's a combination of its its chemical name is sodium and borate. Sodium borate together. It's uh, that's the molecule itself. Yeah, so basically, it's uh, it can lead to maybe significant manifestations uh, for you if you if you take it. And I don't know how how would that relieve joint pain. I'm not sure uh, where that came from. But the other one is which is which I find uh, interesting is uh, I mean, there's a lot of people who go into gyms and do bodybuilding and stuff like that, like bodybuilders ingesting synthol into the muscles. So how yes. what, what's that practice? Okay. Uh, to start, synthol is a chemical compound made out of mostly triglycerides and lidocaine. Lidocaine, we all know it's a local anesthetic. And this trend uh, started a very long time ago. It's actually uh, has been a trend, I think, as far as the 60s, 70s in the US, when bodybuilders would be preparing for a competition, they would realize that, okay, in bodybuilding, Aesthetics is such an important term. So uh, bodybuilding is actually a sport uh, in the pursuing of aesthetics, an aesthetic look. And uh, you, are, are, you win in a competition if you have an aesthetic body, if you have aesthetic pro proportions, big arms, big legs, whatever. Okay, so a trend came out where people would actually inject that synthol in order to fix asymmetries. So... If a bodybuilder had the right bicep, which was bigger than the left bicep, they would inject a bit of synthol. So that oil that they are injecting could give the effect that the muscle is bigger. It is a very dangerous practice. It has also not been recommended by doctors. Papers have come out about this. It's not recommended at all. 
and if we're injecting a foreign body we know that has potential dangers on the immune system you are injecting a foreign body into uh, into you and uh, it has a lot of adverse effects and the funny part is eventually the effects will subside we we're gonna still have the foreign body in the bicep let's say but the effects will subside and uh, the it's not going to look as pleasing at, as it used to look. Yeah, and I think, so, I think the, uh, that's it. the other issue I can see with it is like you're injecting lidocaine. So if you inject it into a blood vessel, then it can cause arrhythmias, obviously, because lidocaine is a treatment for arrhythmias, but can affect your uh, EKG or uh, electric conduction in the heart. So it can cause arrhythmias. And then if you inject triglycerides, I can see that if it goes into your blood, you can cause like fat embolism or or uh, or even death potentially. I mean, I can see that happening. But this is like potentially like muscle augmentation. Like you do breast augmentation or you do Botox, you you inject uh, some sort of your muscle strength to augment them. Uh, yes, I think this stuff. I think this is another level after injecting PEDs into your body. PEDs, performance enhancing drugs, which are used commonly. Uh, in the bodybuilding world, especially in competitions where testing is not required, uh, I think this is a, a far, a farther level. PEDs uh, sometimes are re uh, recommended by endocrinologists. People know about them. There's a bit of more research about it, but injecting synthol is made ma is majorly toxic. I'm I'm against everything that's going on. I'm inject any type of enhancement. I'm against any type of advantage because we know about the adverse effects. And if such procedures are not done by doctors or by professionals, then they will definitely be, we could say uh, up to 99% certainty that they will be unsafe because there is no medical supervision and no one can play their own doctor. We all have to be safe. Right, exactly. I mean, it's crazy. Well, and this was TikTok too, right? Was it TikTok or Instagram? Uh, no, this has been uh, a trend before uh, social media even existed, surprisingly. But are people like re reliving it on TikTok or no? Right now? Uh, yes, they are mentioning it on TikTok. They are mentioning it on TikTok, especially on the channels that are related to uh, uh, aesthetics and uh, how boys should grow. I, I don't know. So sometimes I get this content on my algorithm and I'm still surprised. <laughs> yeah, and I mean the, the other one that's crazier because these days, like everybody, everybody's talking about like weight loss medications. Like in Lebanon, I think a lot of people use Ozempic, uh, and in the in the US, it's like Zepbound, Manjaro, like multiple other ones like Wegovi, and all this stuff. And even like companies are starting to sell. Like I mean, the FDA came out with a warning saying that you need to take the the drug that's offered by the drug company and not take like any of the uh, synthetic drugs that are being given to patients at this point because a lot of these uh, drugs are in back order. Well, but the crazy one is maybe you should not do uh, any of these drugs. You should do cotton balls, right? Like a cotton ball diet uh, dipped in liquids such as juices or smoothies. Like you, you, you dip a cotton ball in, in smoothie and drink it and this should this is supposed to i mean how does that work to make you lose weight okay so uh, as you said yes uh, weight loss uh, is a is a major trend is a major title uh, it's a better word to use it's the major title right now in lebanon and in the world and ozempic is a star drug and we're all hearing about it uh, we know about the effects we know about the side effects that's all researched but this this i think i think this just might be the craziest trend i heard of if anyone has any worse or more danger any worse or dangerous trend please send them to me i would be more than happy to know about them the cotton ball diet as you said is a diet that involves consuming cotton balls but not in a plain way let's let's pay attention to that they dip the cotton ball in any juice, in any sauce or whatever, and they ingest it. As they, uh, as they uh, profess that the cotton ball, eventually when we ingest it, it will eventually expand in the stomach and it will induce a feeling of satiety. 
that's their uh, that's what they're professing that's their argument okay just let us uh, uh, state something it's very dangerous to do it's a crazy thing to do and we could mention all of the side effects and all of the dangers because of this first of all uh, we are talking about nutritional uh, deficiencies a cotton ball diet is not a recommended diet second of all it's a toxic compound it should not be in the gi system we cannot ingest it and th- those are the yeah, that's those are two main points because of everything we're not talking about the choking hazard because of in- in- ingesting these balls uh, we're not talking about it's it's crazy we are, we are not mentioning any of the problem uh, any of the additional problems related to it yeah i mean you said crazy great things uh, going on yes. one of the things i mean since we mentioned all the stuff i mean we talked about social media and now there's the advent of uh, chat gpt and and uh, artificial intelligence i mean people uh, information now is so available like there's an overload of information for for people to use at this point how should people deal with all this information i think i think also it's an over a uh, simplification to say you know go to your go to your doctor and ask them every time because there's not enough doctors to answer all these questions but how do people how are people going to be able to filter all this information and and know what's right and what's wrong like what's a good way to do that okay uh, that's a very nice question actually doctors fears a few years ago before the advent of uh, chat gpt and uh, all of these ai tools was patients looking up their symptoms on google and we all know the memes and we all know the funny parts that uh, someone could look up a headache and bam they think they have a tumor in their head <laughs> so uh, we know how dangerous that is i believe that as doctors and as medical professionals or future medical professionals we not only have a job towards ourselves or towards the patients that we're treating but towards the community we need to be able to filter out this information that might be dangerous or might be toxic to any individual and promote good health practices or good practices at home playing the devil's advocate i believe looking up information online is not a bad thing i might think that it could help with more information and people actually knowing more about their symptoms or uh, medical uh, cases or trends or whatever taking uh, going on but uh, i recommend that with uh, caution so uh, people who are actually look, looking up such things or looking up information should tread very slowly and very carefully if trend or advice does not have a medical basis does not have a medical paper linked to it and if that medical paper is not actually published by a reputable uh, institution i am totally against any advice that might be put out by that, that source always check the source for whatever you're watching whatever you're reading the information you're reading about because i believe and that's i believe i believe that almost to 100% certainty that most of the information out there is fake and is not recommended the good advice that we can find could be uh, could be limited i believe that it's super limited we ha- you ha- always have to check the source you have to check who published it and what the credentials of the person who is publishing or uh, talking about that advice that he or she is giving who are they and what are their credentials and are they actually reputable people that we can trust with giving out such information and not just clicking on the first link that we get and listening to that person's advice and following it right because in the past you used to like people could read medical journals let's say they come to your house and there a lot of them are peer reviewed so there's people who have reviewed these articles and uh and looked at their uh looked at the data made sure it's accurate and stuff like that and now anybody can post post anything on on social media and and record it so i think doctors uh, there are a lot of doctors now are on social media too and they can counter potentially some of this stuff by having their own social media accounts uh discussing certain diseases and actually even they use it for promotion 
uh, in that case. So exactly. from you from you guys' standpoint as, as medical students, I mean, you're much younger than us at this point. And I think the way we learned in the past, we used to, like to go to class. I don't know if you guys still learn the same way, but uh, I remember the AUB days when you just call like med one, med two, you sit in class, you write notes. Uh, in our case, we used to have like one guy who wrote all the notes in the lectures. And then he would uh, take them uh, uh, to, to a rally copy center across the maybe They would uh, copy them all and sell them to us afterwards. Uh, <laughs> now, I think, um, I bet, I hope you get your information in a different way at this point. How do you guys get your medical information? How do you confirm its uh, legitimacy? Okay, uh, so uh, times have changed. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. <Diab>. <laughs> 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 So uh, to start off, the information that we get in class or we are learned is uh, on a platform. It's all online, be it PowerPoints or voice over PowerPoints or whatever. So that's how we study mainly. And uh, the internet has played a positive role mostly. If we want to look something up, we do not have to go to the library and look up uh, that information that we are looking for in books. It's all on the internet, but as I said, we do focus on the source where we are getting that information from. If it's not from a peer-reviewed journal, if it's not from a reputable institution, an academic institution, we let that information go. We could not trust that information. And uh, I believe that as future uh, healthcare professionals, as I mentioned before, we have a duty towards our community in promoting safe uh, practices and giving out safe advice. We already know uh, about how uh, a doctor is given such importance or the doctor's advice is given such importance in Lebanon. And as such people, with people who actually look up to us in order to guide them in whatever they do medically, medically speaking, I believe that we should always be well informed about any advice that we are giving or any uh, trend that we are refuting so uh so what's your advice to people your age like young people your age who are uh, either medical students or even not in medical school when when they're bombarded with all this information let's say a friend of yours goes to the gym every day is trying to uh improve his uh his appearance uh, get more muscular uh <laughs> Uh, so uh, it comes to you and says, you know, I'm going to inject myself with whatever synthol. How do you counter that? And what advice do you give him to build his muscles or hair muscles otherwise? Okay, putting aside all the rage I would be feeling for the first five to ten minutes and the bad reaction of what, what the hell are you even thinking about? Putting all of that aside, I would uh, take a step back and I would actually tell them about the dangerous effects of such a thing, giving them a good uh, information, showing them actual papers that talk about how dangerous it is, talking about all the people who have had the major effects because of this, God forbid, death, and uh, talk about any other practice that could be uh, considered a healthier approach to, let's say, this example talking about working out being in uh, eating well exercising well sleeping well good advice could only be such an important mainstay for their uh, workout routine and that's how i would tackle it uh, taking uh, taking things from a more medical and healthier point of view all right so manuel how do you how do you build your muscles yourself how do I build my muscles? Thank you. I'm going to take that as a compliment, first of all. Uh, I eat well. I sleep well. Uh, we woke up now to record at 4.30 a.m. in Lebanon. I try to exercise as much as I can, and uh, that's it. It's a, it's a very simple, uh, three simple step. <laughs> it's a bit more complex than that, but uh, it, it does make a difference. Yeah. It does make a difference as long as we're consistent. Yeah, I think what we should do is uh, to include in this podcast and we put on the audio and the video version, we include the videos or the audio version of these uh, videos before each one we discuss just for people to to listen to them. And we'll see what people have, what other uh, crazy stuff people can comment on and give us advice on uh, for this. So I have one more question for you. So I think you woke up at like 3.30 or 4.30 a.m. Beirut time uh, for this. So what... 
what do you have uh, today in, in medical schools? I have a clinical skills rotation uh, at the hospital with uh, Dr. Wirsch Shadowing, a specialist in family medicine. Uh, it's a full day at the clinic with patients visiting us, uh, doing the basic checkup and having case studies after the patient leaves with the doctor. It's super interesting. I like it a lot. It's the first uh, glimpse of clinical work that uh, I observe and I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to the clinical rotations later on in MET3. Excellent, man. Excellent. And uh, one more thing. It looks like you, you told me you work for the Red Cross too. Uh, I volunteer. Yes, I volunteer for the Lebanese Red Cross. I've been an EMT for almost eight years now. Uh, I'm currently a mission leader and an ambulance driver, along with other uh, credentials in the field. And uh, yes, it's a major part of my life. And, and I cannot you're, you're a busy man, so you do this in addition to going to medical school. Yes, yes, yes. Good job, man. Thank you. Yeah, it was great discussing these issues with you, and hopefully we'll, we'll show people the videos and we'll discuss them. And uh, I think the most important thing we can get out of this podcast is people, for people to, to filter out the information, as in, I think, healthcare, as in even all other information, such as political information and all other stuff. There's a lot of opinions out there. There's a lot of people who give their opinions without evidence-based, and it's always important to, to filter this information, uh, make sure it's true, before accepting it or sharing it. Uh, because you see a lot of people too these days with like WhatsApp and stuff, you can send somebody a WhatsApp and suddenly it's shared like 1,000 times uh, uh, all over the place. And then you look at it and it's like, oh, it's not true. So I think it's really exactly. important to look at the truth of things before quickly sharing them. Exactly, exactly. We all know about the voice notes that we get on WhatsApp, spreading rumors, spreading misinformation. I'm not just talking about medical advice, any, anything. Such voice notes, um, if we're talking about voice notes, uh, could, cause, uh, could cause big outcry, could cause a lot of panic. Just don't be that person. Don't share such voice notes when you receive them. Don't share such pictures. Always be, always keep an open mind about what you're reading, about what you're listening to. Check the validity of the information that you're receiving before actually sharing it, or in the case of medical advice, actually applying it. Right, exactly. Uh, thank you for, thank you, Manuel, for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Dr. Diab. It was a pleasure. 